Good morning and welcome to Sophie Ridge on Sunday. Let's be honest, Boris Johnson was never someone who was going to leave quietly. But in the last 36 hours, the former Prime Minister has been spray gunning, well, just about everyone. The Privileges Committee, a kangaroo court that launched a witch hunt into Partygate. Conservative MPs, don't these people realise they're only in Parliament because of me, he said. And above all, dishonourable Rishi Sunak. So where does it all leave us? Is this the start of a campaign of rebellion from Boris Johnson's allies to undermine the Prime Minister? Or whisper it. Could the PM actually emerge in a stronger position now the self-styled chief thorn in the side is leaving Parliament? We'll try and find out on the show today with our guests. In just a moment, often sent out on the defence when the government's having a tough time, Energy Security and Net Zero Secretary Grant Shapps. We'll be joined live by someone who knows Boris Johnson better than most, his former Downing Street Director of Communications, Gitto Hari, on the programme this morning. And for Labour, we'll talk to the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, that is Pat McFadden. Plus, with three by-elections coming, and of course a much bigger election across the country, possibly a year away, we'll try and work out what it all means with the polling expert and Chief Executive of Ipsos Mori, Ben Page. The state of the NHS is one of the PM's biggest headaches and frankly a big worry for all of us. With more doctor strikes coming next week, we'll talk to the chair of the BMA Junior Doctors Committee, Rob Lawrenson. And a topic that isn't talked about enough, the menopause. We'll try and put that right today with the Labour MP and campaigner, Carolyn Harris. Good morning. Well, an absolutely packed show on an extraordinary weekend of politics. Lots to get our teeth stuck into. So we can start this morning with the government. A little earlier, I spoke to the Energy Security and Net Zero Secretary, Grant Shapps. Have you noticed that on weeks in Westminster, where it seems everything has been set on fire, you were the one sitting in the seat on Sunday. Are you Number 10's human fire blanket? I'm sure it's entirely coincidental. I mean, I, I come on your programme from time to time. That was on very recently, and I don't recall uh, anything specific, but uh, I'm always pleased to come on your programme. I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, the Dominic Cummings story, the, morning, the week after the local election results, the week after Boris Johnson dramatically quitting Parliament, and this is a Grant Shapps week. I mean, things are well, Look, I'm always pleased when you invite me on. I'm very happy to discuss uh, the issues of the day, so it's, it's, it's good to be here. So I guess the human fire blanket today will tell us that everything is fine in the Conservative Party and what's happening with Boris Johnson is just a distraction. Well, look, I, I think people around the country, uh, you, inside and outside the party, will recognise that Boris was, uh, is somebody with you know, many qualities, but we are now in a world where there are different challenges um, to face and we've got new management in number 10, getting on with the job and getting on with the priorities of this country, like, you know, growing the economy and, and, and stopping the small boats where we've seen some success. So I think the world has sort of moved on from what was quite a dramatic period under Brexit and, of course, under the, uh, you know, the, the issues related to, the, to COVID and, and the vaccine and the rest of it. So do you think the world's moved on from Boris Johnson? Well, I mean, clear, just factually speaking, Boris Johnson's no longer um, Prime Minister. And, you know, as I say, I think people... Are, appreciate. I, I, I like Boris Johnson. I worked under his administration. He had successes, many successes to his name, in, including breaking the Brexit impasse and including getting this country vaccinated first. Um, but there was also always a lot of drama that came with all of that. Uh, the world has moved on, not least because of Putin's invasion of Ukraine, the high levels of inflation that created, and so things like fighting uh, inflation and uh, growing the economy and the things that Rishi Sunak is focused on now. And it has to be said, having some success with, with things like stop, you know, reducing the number of small boats, we've seen them down you 20 say, percent um, this year. I think the world has moved on in that regard. You, you say that there was always a lot of drama around Boris Johnson, which is a bit of an understatement, really. Um, are you hoping that now some of that drama the soap opera, if you like, will come to an end? Well, uh, my, my, my sense is that what people want are basically the, the five priorities that this Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, I was wondering how long out. it would be to, yeah. to you got to that. There we go. Yes. You, uh, so someone on Twitter said, please don't let him say what the five priorities are unless you specifically ask what are the five I won't, priorities. I won't, I, won't, I won't give you a list, but I will say that things like 
stopping the small boats, as I mentioned, are really important. And we're having success in that, right? The, the what numbers was the question are down twenty percent. Yes, I mean, are, are we moving on? Has the world moved? Yes, yeah, of course, it, of course, it's moved on. And these are things are of are facts, aren't they? The, Boris Johnson has now said that he is stepping down uh, as an MP. So, yes, factually, things have moved on. Um, now, according to the newspapers this morning, this all stems partly from a meeting nine days ago between Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson. And Boris Johnson's allies are accusing Rishi Sunak of effectively going back on his word and not allowing through the people that Boris Johnson, or all of the people that Boris Johnson wanted to nominate for peerages? Well, look, I don't want to comment on individual meetings that I wasn't um, at. I, I, I can't confirm that either way. What I can say for certain is that Rishi Sunak has not changed, altered uh, the list in any way. In fact, there is a House of Commons Appointments uh, Commission, uh, or HOLAC, uh, as it's called, which looks at all nominations. There's a very, very uh, long-tested uh, sort of protocol in place where former prime ministers put people up for the House of Lords. I think I'm right in saying that Gordon Brown put up about 50 people uh, in his nominations list. And the prime minister who comes in usually passes on. In this particular case, uh, because Number 10's actually published the, uh, the, the, the details, you can see that uh, Rishi did not change that list at all. The House of Commons Commission will have made all of those decisions, and the Prime Minister uh, has not intervened in any way. Do you think Boris Johnson didn't understand the details, then? Is that what you're saying? Occasionally, Boris wouldn't be all over the detail. I don't know whether that's what happened in this particular case. OK. Uh, of course, the real trigger uh, was Boris Johnson receiving the findings of the Privileges Committee report into whether he misled Parliament over Partygate. He says it's a kangaroo court. He says it's a witch hunt. Do you agree with him? Well, look, uh, Boris has seen this report. I haven't. Other MPs haven't seen the report yet. So I have to uh, get receipt of, uh, of that. There's a formal process that's put in place. I don't want to undermine Parliament itself, which is what... Um, coming to that conclusion uh, would do. So hang on, so, so you say coming to the conclusion that the privilege, Privileges Committee is a kangaroo cult or a witch hunt would be undermining Parliament? Well, Parliament itself sets up these committees and they are uh, set up in, in proportion to the current uh, makeup of, of Parliament, um, which is, I, I don't know, 54%. Conservative, so there'll be conservatives on that committee. So you're saying that Boris Johnson's undermining? I, 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 I'm simply saying I haven't seen that report. Uh, only Boris has seen it, so I don't know quite what he's getting at when he says that. I haven't seen the report. I haven't seen the evidence they presented. What I do believe is it's very important to let committees get on with their uh, work. Uh, it, you know, I think the point of a member being sent details in advance, as has happened with Boris is that it gives somebody the opportunity to comment on it and say, no, this is an inaccuracy here or, or what have you, and, and challenge elements before it's published. Uh, as I say, I haven't seen it, so you're asking me to comment on something I haven't seen. Uh, do I think that the process uh, is, is, is proper? Well, that's a decision for Parliament, not the government, but Parliament and MPs to decide themselves. And this is the process that MPs have collectively decided should be in place in situations like this. So Boris Johnson, in his resignation letter, says there is a witch hunt underway to take revenge for Brexit and ultimately to reverse the 2016 referendum result. I definitely don't feel that way. I think I'm somebody who thinks that... I, mean, I actually happen to vote for uh, Brexit as, as it happens, but I actually do think it's working in favour for this country. I'm seeing how we're now able to move much faster uh, in getting on with the uh, job in lots of different ways, uh, changing rules which enable us to bring in more innovative uh, tech and uh, actually use the advantages of being outside of the EU but working very closely with our neighbours and friends. So I, I think far from wanting to undo it, I think we're in a phase now of using the many benefits of having that extra, extra flexibility. So, no, I don't think that's the case. I don't want to get into a row about whether or not Brexit is yeah, working no, or, or not, but just to say, you're not the only person... Uh, you're not, not all of your colleagues agree with you uh, on the treatment of Boris Johnson and the committee report. I just want to have a look at Jake Berry, MP, who tweeted to say this. You voted for Brexit. He's talking about the reader, if you like. You voted for Brexit. The establishment blocked it. You voted for Boris Johnson. The establishment forced him out. Who is in charge here, the voters or the blob? Do you agree with Jake Barry? No. Um, you know, actually, in the end, uh, 
Boris was perfectly entitled to remain as a MP. He has decided to stand down, and a couple of my uh, other colleagues, all of whom I should say I've worked with, and, uh, and, and, and Boris in particular, I, uh, I liked working with him uh, as Prime Minister. But, as I said right at the, the, the beginning of this, the world has moved on. He is the one who's removed himself from uh, the current sort of political um, scene, standing down as a Member of Parliament. And we've got excellent leadership in place I guess, in Number 10 with I guess, Sunak. I guess what Jake Berry and other supporters are saying is that they feel it's undemocratic. You know, Boris Johnson won an election landslide, mm. unlike Rishi Sunak, by the way, uh, who you know, hasn't got his mandate from the electorate in the same way that Boris Johnson did. He was elected by the voters in his constituency of Uxbridge and South Ryslip. And once again, they feel it's MPs, it's his own side almost, forcing him out, not the public. Well, as I say, only, only, only Boris Johnson himself can make the decision, as he's done, to stand down from Parliament. No one has asked Well, him they've said to do so. the, the, the Privileges Committee is going to give, if, is, if we understand it correctly, is going to give him a suspension that is so long he'd have to face a by election. Well, as I say, uh, uh, he's had the benefit of seeing that. A committee report. It's a parliamentary committee. It's not something the government is is doing. Uh, and so these are, you know, these things are Boris Johnson's decision to do. I think actually, you know, when you look at, and I'm not going to list the five priorities, but if you look at the priorities of this country, getting on with the the job after you know COVID and a war in Ukraine and very high inflation, those are the things that people are really concerned about. Yeah, and okay. those are the things that this prime minister is focused on Rishi Sunak's Well, if he's not doing on... a very good job, is he, if you look at the polls? I mean, in the resignation letter, the one thing that Boris Johnson does unarguably get right is that when he left office last year, the government was a handful of points behind in the polls. That gap's widened just a few years after winning the biggest majority in almost half a century. That majority is now clearly at risk. You cannot argue with that. That's not... And so if you basically say that Rishi Sunak is getting on with the job, is in tune with what, pe what people want, what they're saying is, we don't really like what's, what's yeah, that's, happening. I was going to say, that's not quite the full story, is it? Because, if you recall, last summer, there were rather a lot of different changes, including a, a, another Prime Minister as well, and that's when we were a very, very long behind, way behind in the polls, over 30 points behind. We know from the local elections where I think we were nine points behind, it's actually a lot closer Oh, come on, that. the local elections were... were well, e OK, well, even if you want to use party. the same basis, say the polling was 30 points behind and it's now, say, 15 points behind. In other words... Uh, Rishi Sunak focusing on people's actual priorities, stopping the small boats and, and growing the economy uh, and, and the rest of it, means that actually we are seeing that poll gap narrow. But let's just be absolutely key, you know, and I know you won't want me to talk about the other option, which is a Keir Starmer uh, government, but the reality is we have very low unemployment in this country, near record levels of high employment. All of that's happened under a Conservative government and there's never been a Labour government that hasn't left unemployment higher in history. And so that's the real challenge here, is to make sure we can preserve the things which are working, like a uh, lot of jobs available in our economy. Do you think Boris Johnson will come back? I have. I, I, the one thing I know about Boris Johnson is never predict what Boris Johnson will, will uh, do next. So I have no idea uh, what will happen uh, with regards to that. Would you like uh, him to? I do to? know. I, I, I'm sure he's got many other things he wants to get on to doing. That doesn't sound he's... like you're really gagging. Oh, I was going to say, I, I was going to say, he's spent, he spent a huge amount of... Uh, he's spending a lot of time around the world uh, uh, making a, a lot of... Uh, so that's what you want great, him to do, leave the country, speeches. not just Parliament. I, I, as I say, don't, uh, you won't find me saying bad things about Boris. I enjoyed working <laughs> with Boris. I thought he was... Uh, I thought he was the right man for that time, particularly to break that Brexit impasse, which he successfully did. I thought he was very good lead in leadership of the world in Ukraine after the invasion and other things. But a lot of drama came with it. We've got a series of very important things that we're focused on now, like reducing inflation and growing the economy. And those things are starting to work. We see Germany in recession, the Eurozone in recession, this country actually escaping recession uh, because we've got the right measures in place under Rishi. I, uh, well, I think lots of people would say that if you look at the econ economic situation, if you really want to go down the argument mm. about what mm. economic situation we're in with a you know, mortgage sort of time bomb, inflation much stickier uh, than expected, I'm not sure that that's really the but strong point that you'd be fighting well, for, well, just, and zero growth. Well, I, ju I just say, first of all, it's not zero growth. We just had the biggest upgrade uh, of any uh, country uh, in, I think, the Iron... Flatlining port. growth in the UK. Uh, no, uh, they're actually predicting growth this year. Of growth and, of what? Uh, I think 0.5%, uh, 0.7%. Uh, oh. is, is, is possible, depending on which uh, uh, economists uh, you follow. Uh, remember that six months ago they said that we would be in recession. Remember 
that Germany is in recession, that the Eurozone is in recession. And I know there's a kind of desire to sort of constantly say somehow that we're doing worse than everyone else. Our economy grew I'm... faster... I'm not the saying G7 that. last I'm year and that. the year before, I'm just, I'm not and we'll be right that. up there this year. I'm not, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we, we have 0.5% growth predicted, inflation running at around 10%. No, eight, this, is uh, four, eight, this is a fall in real incomes, and it's really, really, really uh, difficult for people right now, and I don't think we should necessarily be you know, rubbing our hands with yeah, no, like the state uh, Look, of the I'm not in any way, shape or for, so, form saying that. I am saying that things like unemployment are great achievements. Okay. But that's why the first on the list of five that you won't allow me to mention is to get to, to halve inflation. And it is why, uh, you know, inflation's like a tax on people. It is why we're working so hard on that. Uh, it's why Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, and Rishi are uh, so focused on that as their first priority. It costs everybody when inflation's high, and that's why we're, 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 put, we're pressing down on it. Uh, you've got a couple of by-elections coming up now, because not only is Boris Johnson stunning down, but two of his uh, key yeah. allies are as well. Could be pretty tricky, particularly in Uxbridge. I mean, you're a former party chair. How confident are you feeling about that? Yeah, look, I, we will fight for every vote, as a, every former and current party chair will tell, tell you. Um, and we'll be presenting our, our message. And what we'll be saying to people in Uxbridge or elsewhere is, look, it, since the only other viable option to run the country is, is Keir Starmer or a combination of him and the Lib Dems and the SNP, goodness knows what else, know what you're voting for, which in, you know, just in the last week, we've seen Labour either pledging or not pledging £28 billion pounds of tax and spend uh, on a programme which is you know, in a mess uh, and, uh, and, and doing whatever Just Stop Oil tell them should be their policy on energy, my area, which would cost families a fortune. That £28 billion, uh, pledge is about £1,000 per family. They want to put our energy policy in the hands of people they like would, Putin. They would argue, I mean, look, I'm going to talk about the 28 billion policy with Labour, as you'd expect, uh, but they would argue, look, this is actually about energy security, something that people really, really uh, care about, and it's also about creating half a million and, jobs. And it's extraordinary that their actual policy uh, would create energy insecurity, make us reliant on tyrants like Putin by importing gas and oil uh, that uh, we need still, as we make that transition to net zero, we end up importing it from abroad. And worse still, okay. we double the carbon. Okay. It's a completely illiterate policy that they've got from their, their, from their Just Stop Oil friends. Well, let's, let's talk, let, we'll talk about that policy with Labour. Um, I just want to talk to you about one of your uh, policies uh, as well, if I may, because you know, there has been some criticism by Ro Boris Johnson for Rishi Sunak not following through with some of his plans. It feels like one of them could be the plan for Great British Railways. I mean, that's your baby. You're trying to fix the way that railways are fragmented, if you like. And the Times have reported that it won't be in the King's speech. It's being watered down, no legislative powers to sign off contracts to set fares. Are you a bit worried? So, so just to be absolutely clear, Great British Railways is happening, as I understand it. I'm no longer Transport Secretary. You can have the Transport Secretary talk about it, but uh, it, it is happening. It is a different way to arrange the, the railways. An awful lot of what's required doesn't require uh, a major act of Parliament immediately to get that going. So... Uh, the body itself is being established. I think it's going to be based in uh, Derby. The competition uh, was, was, was announced um, for the headquarters. Uh, a lot of what's required can be done by repurposing the kind of vehicles that are already there. So I think the question of at what point do you have to pass the so-called primary legislation mm. through Parliament is separate to getting on with the okay. job of reorganising the way the railways run, uh, and that's continuing. OK, uh, the thing that you uh, want to talk to uh, about today uh, is more funding to support people with health issues to stay at work. What's the mm. idea? Look, we, we have, uh, as I say, a great track record on employment, uh, but we're also aware, and particularly post-COVID, of people who've found it difficult to stay in the workplace or are dropping out of the workplace. The funding that we're making available uh, to ensure that people can stay in work and are supported to, to do so, uh, we think where people can be ac economically active, it's better for them, it's better for their health, it's better for the economy as well. OK, and just finally, uh, we're going to be talking to the BMA later on the programme because, of course, junior doctors are striking next week, part of a long-running uh, dispute. We'll get their view later, but what's your message to them? S simply this, um, you know, first of all, uh, to the whole of um, the, the health service and the NHS, uh, you know, we really want to see this service working for people. Is why one of the pledges that I won't mention is to uh, cut the waiting lists, which I won't list in, in detail, but just cut the waiting lists. 
Um, and uh, one of the things we need to do as a responsible government is press down on inflation as well. We can't be in a situation where we end up in a spiral of pay claims which bust inflation and end up in a position where we never get inflation out of the system. So it's about coming to a fair settlement, both for the junior doctors and for the rest of the public service, and frankly, people who don't work in the public service, to make sure that we are uh, getting that balance right. And that's what we're trying to do. I really hope that these... Uh, industrial disputes can be brought to a close so we can all get on with the things we're, we're trying to do. For example, we've got rid of the two-year waits, we've got rid of 90% of the 18-month waits, we're making progress uh, with the NHS recovery plan post-COVID. OK, we'll put some of those points uh, to the junior doctors later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Grant Chaps uh, there. The world has moved on from Boris Johnson, according to Grant Chaps. Well, as you can tell, inescapably, the main topic of the day is, of course, Boris Johnson. And one man who knows his thinking better than most is Gutu Hari, who was with him in his City Hall days when the Mayor of London, and more recently, his communications director in, shall we say, tumultuous times at Downing Street. He joins us uh, now. Uh, I've been really looking forward to interviewing on the show, <laughs> frankly, because... We see an awful lot of anonymised quotes from allies of Boris Johnson with no idea who they are. You are an ally of Boris Johnson. Um, you're close to him. If anyone can help us get inside his head, it's you. So what do you think is going on inside Boris Johnson's head right now? I think what he's done is take charge this weekend of a situation that was out of his control and drifting, you know, inevitably towards a very, very unhappy and undignified sort of conclusion. And so, if you like, he's gone jumping in, you know, waving Union Jacks, if you like, um, rather than be dragged kicking and screaming out of Parliament. And though I won't join those who openly criticise the process and all that, I do understand why he feels uh, understandably aggrieved by the process that has not only taken him out of office, stopped him being Prime Minister, but now hounded him out of politics. Because, as you rightly said, he is a man who uh, defied political gravity and only a couple of years ago, a few years ago, won the biggest majority for 40 years. And so I think those people who voted Conservative, most of them having never contemplated voting Conservative before, it was very much a personalised Boris-branded pitch at the last election, will feel aggrieved that the man who they wanted as Prime Minister is now not even in Parliament, not to mention in number 10. I want to get into some of those processes a bit later in the interview. Um, he dramatically quit his seat for now. Do you think he's going to be back? Uh, you never know. He keeps, you know, he deliberately leaves us guessing, doesn't he? Hasta la vista, baby, or, you know, more classical references. It's very important. It's virtually impossible to, to write him off. But I don't think this is part of an elaborate plot mm. to sort of destabilise and topple Rishi Sunak. I think uh, Boris Johnson feels that there is an opportunity for him now to go off and, you know, lick his wounds, but also sees new opportunities. He's a very talented uh, person. He's in demand around the world as a speaker. He's writing his memoirs. He's a great writer. So there's a little time for him to be out of the fray, but will he come back one day? Who knows? In other words, then, is it because he thinks he would lose the by-election in his seat? I think why, really? it's a little bit... None of us wants to interview for our own job, and we certainly want to be interviewed for our own job under the most appalling circumstances where a committee led, frankly, by a woman who I've got a lot of respect for, but among the many jobs that Harriet Harman has done in the past, has been leading the Labour Party. She was deputy leader of the Labour Party for a long time. Can you imagine any Labour supporter being happy if someone like William Hague, shall we say, uh, had, had, had the fate of Keir Starmer in his hands when he was caught drinking beer and having curry with friends a long way from home in the middle of lockdown. I don't think people would be comfortable with that process, nor should they be. And so I understand why Boris feels aggrieved, and I understand why a lot of people watching this will think, whoa, so a committee led by the former Labour leader can actually hound Boris out of office, when the police actually found him guilty of one minor misdemeanour that was worth a 50 quid fine. At the same time, it's not just Harriet Harman, though, is it? It's a cross-party group. There's a majority of Conservatives on that committee. Yeah, that doesn't... You know, that's often uh, worse than having your political opponents there as people from the same party. As you know better than most, um, Sophie, there's so many cross-currents in a party and, you know, so I don't think that having a Conservative majority means that your, you know, well-being is, is safeguarded. It also had to be voted through by the House as well, so he's assuming that... The majority, a lot, a considerable number of people on his own side went back in too. I think he's just thinking, do you know, the true test in a democracy is whether the people vote for you. 14 million people voted him for him 
pretty much at the last election. They voted for MPs, but it was very much... But he could have gone speech. to vote in Uxbridge then, couldn't he? That would be the ultimate Well, he test. could have done, but again, you know, in the situation when you are standing in a by-election under these sort of circumstances where people are reading that you've lied to Parliament because the former leader of the Labour Party has decided that you did, it's not ideal to have to reapply for your own job. So I don't blame him at all for just saying, you know, basta così, enough is enough, I'm out of here. Have you spoken to him? I speak to him from time to time. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think he is enjoying, you know, life uh, beyond politics. Um, his personal life is in a great place. He's going to be a father again uh, very, very soon. And uh, he's travelling the world. So and earning quite a bit of money as well. Yeah, which, which he hasn't done for most of his life. <laughs> um, now, we talked a bit about the Partygate inquiry. The other strand of this is the honours that Boris Johnson put forward and this meeting uh, between Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson. Um, we heard from Grant Chapp saying that actually Rishi Sunak didn't get involved in the process, it was all completely kosher above board. Perhaps Boris Johnson didn't understand the details of what was happening. Uh, like Grant, I wasn't in the room, so I don't know what happened at that meeting. Um, but uh, as I understand it, there's been a lot of toing and froing about this list. Uh, and I think the relevant authorities were not happy with the scale of it and some of the nominations in it, uh, originally. Uh, what is nice about the final list is I look at colleagues who I've known for a long, long time, people who put in an enormous shift at City Hall, eight years of the mayoralty, people whose names you probably don't know, certainly most of the audience don't, but Boris has, in this list, taken care of a whole load of, you know, decent men and women who put in an enormous shift without fame nor fortune. And these people are important to keep the show on the road. And if we think that politics matters, then we've got to be a little bit less contemptuous of people engage in politics, whether they're in the back room or front of house. You were on the list? Yes, but the real honour for me was having a chance to serve in number 10 last year. It was brutal. It was pretty rough. Um, but it was also very important, and Boris led the world in helping Zelensky stand up to Putin in the Ukraine. He helped lead Britain out of COVID, and unfortunately, we crashed into a cost of living crisis, and he got wrestling with that. He was wrestling with energy policy. There was all this stuff going on, and yet, if you turned on the television, with some exceptions, most of the time, all you would hear was this constant myopic diet of partygate this, partygate that, partygate this, partygate that. And so he never had a fair hearing, I don't think, uh, last year. No. Some of that was partly of his own making, but, you know, some things happened before I got there. But I think there was an awful lot to be proud of that happened last year, and a lot for people like Boris to feel aggrieved of that it was basically taken away from him. I mean, you were there in an absolute roller coaster of a time, weren't you? Yeah. What, what do you think was the maddest day, the day, the most difficult day? Or... Funny enough, the moment where I thought it was lost was when the party when when those who managed the Conservative Party told Boris that they did not want to oppose this Labour motion to set up the Privileges Committee. Because for me, we had already had a police investigation, we had the Sue Gray inquiry, um, there'd been a vote of confidence in Boris, which he won, two-thirds of the party backed him. So I thought, surely at this point, we can just move on and focus on what we need to do to sort of to address the concerns of voters rather than the obsessions of the Twitterati and, you know... I, of... I do just want to come back because, yeah. you know, when we talk about party gap, I get a lot of people saying, this is, this is a huge part of our life. We couldn't mm. see loved ones. We lost people without saying goodbye to them. And that goes and, for and him and as Boris well. Johnson... He lost his mother, I lost my sister. It's it, this narrative that somehow out there people were suffering and in here they were partying. A, they were not partying, you know, but full pack. They were rules. working hard. And he got a 50 quid fine. Now, that would be the end of the matter for a civilian. But in Boris Johnson's case, something that the police, with all their powers of investigation, all the due process and the thoroughness with which they check things out, found him guilty of something worthy of a 50 quid fine. Since then, he's been hounded out of office as prime minister and now hounded out of parliament. I mean, in terms of proportionality, if he was a civilian, um, that, would be, that would be unfair. Does he blame Rishi Sunak? I don't think he blames uh, Rishi Sunak, um, you know, for, for, for much of this. He was very but disappointed at the time that Rishi Sunak did not even tell him face to face that he was resigning. I mean, because the other person who resigned on that day, Sajid Javid, did. He was, you know, man enough, if you like, to go and see Boris and tell him to his face, I'm resigning, I can't stand this anymore. We discovered on the telly that, that Rishi had gone. So, but in the end, the whole party, or a big chunk of the party, turned against Boris. 
And that's the reality he's had to wrestle with. But the reason that they did that is because they couldn't see any other way of stopping this miserable purgatory of turning on the telly every day and all they would see is stuff about Partygate. And so they decided in the end, whether it's fair or not, that they just couldn't carry on with that. The relationship between Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson is obviously pretty toxic, right? Well, I sat down with him every morning, you know, about 8.15, for seven months of my life. Felt like a lot longer. And, um, and actually, I was surprised when I got there because I had not met uh, Rishi Sunak, but the personal chemistry was very, very warm. The two of them got on really well. But there was they, good banter. that was at one time. It's yeah. now changed. Well, yeah, but what I'm saying is I don't think it's a personal thing. I think it's, you know... Rishi is now doing the job that Boris used to do. Now, none of us feel very good about people doing that if it's been forced upon us. Um, I always saw Rishi as the natural successor, mm -hmm. but many, many years down the line. And actually, he cut to the chase, um, though actually he wasn't the beneficiary of the toppling of Boris, it was Liz Truss, but he's eventually ended up uh, in power, and I wish him well, because at this point in time, it is the only game in town. And any Conservative who thinks that prolonging the agony, prolonging the pain, prolonging the division, dancing on Boris's political grave or undermining Rishi Sunak is mad. Do you think there's any way of patching up these warring sides? Yes, because I think in the end, what we now have is very different. We don't have the charisma, we don't have the connection, we don't have that unique kind of uh, so appeal Rishi that Sunak Boris isn't has. as charismatic, you're saying? Oh, clearly not. But he's, he's hard-working, he's clean-living, he beavers away and he does details. So the two of them, for me, were a perfect tag team. You know, they complemented each other's skills very, very well. Now, going into a general election with Rishi will have certain disadvantages versus Boris, particularly when you're appealing to working-class blokes across, you know, swathes of... Uh, the north of England and the north of my native country, Wales, where what, why do you turn think? blue, because because they'll miss that sort of they'll miss that oomph and panaz and 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 alpha male them, I guess. But on the other hand, when you're looking at the choice between Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak, you sort of think, well, actually, if what we need is somebody who's capable and competent and hardworking, then why change? You've got Rishi in there. He's young. He's bright. He's well qualified, particularly to handle the economy. Um, and and he's teetotal. OK. Um, well, that's, yeah, that is one thing that uh, he's differs to uh, Boris Johnson, I guess. Uh, now, just finally, you know, you've been, we've been talking about the interview there. You've been in the eye of the storm as Director of Communications. How are you finding life on the outside? Um, I've just been reliving some of my number 10 days because I've done this podcast mm -hmm. unprecedented and I urge, I'm sure you've listened to it, but uh, I urge anyone who wants to understand what really happened to have a listen because last year was portrayed in sort of polarised, extreme ways and there was a lot more subtlety to it, there was a lot more texture to it. And so I've been reliving that, but otherwise, yeah, I'm doing a lot more shifts with the uh, RNLI where I'm a volunteer on the Thames, uh, hopefully progressing my training there because I, I skimped on my shifts last year <laughs> and, uh, and a lot more time for, you know, family and friends. Always good. Uh, thank you very much indeed for coming on the programme today. Thank, thank you. you. Good to talk. Uh, well, we have heard there from you know, Boris Ally and Grant Shapps, probably not described as a Boris Ally after that uh, interview. And as you would expect, the Labour Party hasn't held back either. The deputy leader, Angela Rayner, said that Boris Johnson is an absolute disgrace and a coward. But the party will no doubt enjoy the focus being back on the Conservatives tearing lumps out of each other. Meanwhile, there was some discomfort of their own this week as Rachel Reeves seemed to row back on the party's much publicised £28 billion a year green spending plans. Well, the Shadow's Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Pat McFadden, joins us now. Good to have you on the programme. Morning. So, Kistama's calling for an election. Why is now the time? Because I don't think there's any cure for this chaos under the current government. Uh, what the last few days have shown us is not only lots of things we already knew about Boris Johnson and how he'd blame everybody else for his downfall, uh, but the way that he attacked Rishi Sunak in this, he, first of all, used and played Rishi Sunak to get approval for this uh, honours list that he wanted before he went. Uh, but then in that resignation statement that he made on Friday, he has attacked a number of policies around uh, not having a trade deal with the United States, uh, post-Brexit policies, uh, the tax position, but he's also attacked Rishi Sunak's future strategy. Uh, he said that uh, if uh, Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt bring in pre-election tax cuts, it'll be seen through as a gimmick. So he's not only attacking 
Rishi present. He's attacking Rishi future too. At the and the conclusion time, is not, this is not over. This it's is going to continue. It's not that surprising, is it, where you know one of your predecessors attacks you? I mean, look at the relationship between Keir Starmer and Jeremy Corbyn. This is nothing new, is it? They're the party of government, and if this goes on, the chaos will continue. You've got Jacob Rees-Mogg, one of uh, Boris Johnson's principal allies, writing in one of the Sunday newspapers today that not only should Boris come back, but that he'd be a good candidate in a future leadership election. So it's quite clear this is going to continue in the Conservative Party, and they cannot fix it themselves. The only way to fix this is to have a general election and a change of government. Uh, otherwise, the country's going to be bedeviled by this chaos and instability, and it's having a real effect on the governance and the economy of the country. There'll be some elections uh, pretty quickly, three by-elections coming up, uh, including, of course, in Boris Johnson's old seat in Uxbridge. Has Labour got a real chance? Yes, I, I, think we, I think we have. We're going to fight all of these by-elections to win. There are no no-go areas for the Labour Party, uh, and I think that these by-elections can be the first step towards removing the government. Uh, that's the message that we'll be giving to voters uh, in those constituencies, and we're going to fight all of them hard, and we're going to fight all of them to win. We just heard from Guti Hari, who was talking about the Privileges Committee and saying that, look, he understands why Boris Johnson feels hounded out uh, by a committee that was led by Harriet Harman, of course, a leading figure in the Labour Party. Boris Johnson has described it as a kangaroo court. Do you understand why some close to Boris Johnson feel that what's happened is a bit undemocratic. You know, he won a landslide, he was elected in Uxbridge. Why is it MPs who are forcing him out? This is Trump-like on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, the statement that he made, apart from the parts which attacked Rishi Sunak right, left and centre uh, on Friday, were all about him avoiding responsibility for his own uh, actions. He's got a record of trying to trash institutions in his own interests. That's what he was doing on Friday. Uh, the committee has a conservative majority. It's got a conservative majority. That's really important for viewers to understand. Also, the committee's verdict isn't the last word. It then goes to Parliament, where the Tories are sitting on a majority of around 66 seats, at least it was on Friday before they all started uh, resigning. And even then, it just triggers a recall uh, petition where he could face the voters. The truth is, he didn't want to face any of the verdicts because he can never accept responsibility for his own actions. And that's true of all these right-wing populist leaders. They're like baby men. Whenever anything goes wrong, it's everybody else's fault. That was the characteristics in the statement on Friday. And it just revealed to us that the Tory party can't resolve this on its own. Right, we've talked an awful lot about Boris Johnson. Let's talk about some other things, shall we? Uh, you've done some analysis on mortgages, which, to be honest, is something that I know many of our viewers are going to be really, genuinely quite worried about. What have you found? We found that, uh, compared to two years ago, uh, interest rates have added some £7,000 a year to the average uh, mortgage bill. And the thing that really put booster rockets under the mortgage rates was the Conservative disastrous mini-budget uh, last September. That's when... Markets lost confidence in the UK. That's when the Tories shredded any reputation for economic stability and responsibility that they had. And people are paying the price for that every month as their previous two or five year rates that they've been on come up for renewal. It's not just that though, is it? Like, I, I accept that you know, what happened in that mini budget was a pretty disastrous for the markets, but look, it's also about other things, isn't it? Like you know, global high inflation uh, as well. And I guess my point is, Rather than looking at the causes of it, what, what's Labour going to do about it? You've identified the problem. What's your solution? Well, first of all, it's a big part of it. That yeah. really what's, puts the Labour's solution. The you solution made that point. has to be financial stability for the long term. Uh, that's what we want to ensure. Uh, the lesson from uh, the experience last September should be that we, any future government, has to put financial stability first. Uh, has to make sure that it matches ambition with responsibility. And that's what will characterise our approach. Um, I just wonder the responsibility argument, the financial stability, if that comes into the debate that is going on around this £28 billion a year that Labour wants to spend on green energy. Now, there's been lots of talk this week about Labour rowing back from the plan. 
But as far as I can tell, you're not really rowing back from it, are you? You're saying that you are going to end up spending 28 billion a year on green energy, but just not immediately. Well, two things have changed since we announced this plan a couple of years ago. First of all, the economic situation that we're talking about. We've had 12 interest rate rises. We've had the experience of that uh, Tory mini budget last year, and that has underlined the need for financial stability. But, but my point is you're still, you're still doing it. OK, you're not doing it in year one, but that was never going to happen, was it? You're still saying that you are going to end up spending 20 But the second a year. thing, the second thing is really important. It's uh, also changed in the last two years, which is in every conversation that we've had with uh, investors and businesses, we've discovered a real thirst for private sector investment in this too. And we've also had the experience of the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States. And that's been not just about what government does, but about crowding in the uh, private sector investment. So I don't think the right lens to look at this through is just what government borrows and invests. An essential part of, of that, this is. It's also about what you can do in partnership with the private sector. We've got a big long-term plan for this. It's also a responsible long-term plan and it can lead the country through a change that is going to happen. It's an awful lot of money, though, isn't it? 28 billion every year. And there's all going to be all sorts of departments who are going to be looking at this saying, hang on a minute, I need to build more homes. I need to invest in schools and hospitals. 28 billion, you could knock a billion off that and say it was a rounding error. Is Ed Miliband, his policy, is he going to cost you another election? Look, uh, this is an ambitious policy. There are always trade-offs and choices uh, in government. But the announcement that we made on Friday said one very important thing to the British public, which is that we will match our ambitions with responsibility. We will also match them by crowding in private sector investment. That's the best way to do this, to lead the country through a big change, so that when it comes to the election, we're matching realism with hope, and that's the okay. right approach. Uh, just finally, um, there have been some allegations, uh, claims made about MPs in the Labour Party and about the behaviour uh, that they have allegedly been part of. Uh, most recently, Labour shadow minister Bambos Sherilambos suspended over a complaint. I don't want to get into the details because obviously there are two sides to every story. People deserve a fair hearing. But is the Labour Party really serious about behaviour in Westminster and rooting anything out that is improper? Yes, we are. Uh, I mean, like you, I don't want to get into an individual case, but I've worked around Westminster for a very long time, uh, both as an MP and previously I worked in Number 10. You know, I want this to be a place where both politicians and the many staff members who, who work there can come into work excited about what they're doing, working in public service, whether they're working for the governing party or the opposition party, uh, and be confident that it's a great place to work. So I'm saddened when I see these allegations. They should all be properly investigated, but let's make sure that Westminster is a good place to work and embodies uh, the best of public service. OK, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Pat McFadden uh, there talking for the Labour Party. You're watching at Sophie Ridge on Sunday. It is a jam-packed show for you uh, this morning. Uh, we've heard, of course, from uh, the government. We've heard from both kind of pro and, I suppose, guests, pro-Boris, pro-Rishi uh, supporters. And The Take will follow this programme probably a little after 9.30 to take, because they've got an awful lot of interviews uh, to get through. But before that... Uh, we are going to get some analysis from Rob Powell, uh, our political correspondent, who is here with us today. Rob, well, what's your big takeaway on the big story of the day, the Boris Johnson story, after hearing people talk this morning? I thought what Grant Shapps said right at the top of the interview risks actually inflaming this sort of battle we've been uh, reporting on for the last couple of days between those close to Boris Johnson and those close to Rishi Sunak, because it was delivered in a sort of typical, affable and amiable way, but it was actually quite biting when you look at what he said. He basically said at one point that the world has moved on um, and that uh, Boris Johnson was the right man for his time, but he was the one that decided to remove himself from the current political scene. Also, when you asked him about you know, whether Boris Johnson was a details man in relation to the honours story, he said occasionally he, could, he might not be across um, the detail. He talked about the Conservative Party being under new management now. That was a phrase Keir Starmer used to try and separate <laughs> himself off from Jeremy Corbyn when he had just taken over. So I think that was quite quietly cutting. And actually from a senior cabinet minister, that suggests that Number 10 um, are, are not afraid to stand their ground on this 
and try and use this whole episode to try and kind of exercise the ghost of Boris Johnson once and for all. And I think if they can do that, actually, this could all be working to their advantage in the longer term. But of course, they've got a bumpy period getting through a few by-elections to come before then. Yeah, absolutely right on the by-elections. I think you're right as well. It was, if you look at the language that he was using, pretty cutting. I think at one point I was like, do you think he'll come back? He's like, well, he's got lots of things to do around the world. It's like you couldn't get any further yeah. away. Um, Rob, thank you very much for your analysis. It's always good to have you on the programme. Rob Powell uh, there. Well, Rob was just talking about those bumpy by-elections coming down the line for the Conservatives. Uh, they are still, of course, a very long way behind Labour in the polls. Uh, most suggest uh, that Keir Starmer would make it into Downing Street at the next election, at least as the biggest party if not with a majority. So a good time to have a closer look at what the polls say, in particular in those three seats up for grabs. We're joined now by the Ipsos Mori CEO, Ben Page. Great to have you on the programme. Nice Morning. to see you. Now, the first question I'm really interested to get your view on is how popular is Boris Johnson? Uh, not very. I think let's, let's just be frank. Two out of three people think he's lied and misled Parliament. And when we asked people which, were the, which prime minister they think did a good job or a bad job, Boris Johnson tops the bad job list by some margin. He does have a, you know, a minority of people who are still fans, but it's much smaller than some of his backbenchers think, That's quite so frankly. I mean, this is what you were just mentioning yeah. about did he lie, did Boris Johnson mislead Parliament? 65% saying he did. I mean, yes. that is a big number, isn't it? It is, exactly. And, but remember, I, I think Boris Johnson did always get a free pass in many ways. Even before he became Prime Minister, um, many more people thought he was untrustworthy and didn't tell the truth than did. Mm. And it just got worse from there. So um, some of that's sort of priced in, and I think that's the key point. Boris Johnson does strange things and accuses Parliament of kangaroo court, etc. For a lot of people, they're just going to say next. Um, I'm interested in your view about Boris Johnson's popularity versus Rishi Sunak. I think we can have a quick look yeah. at some of the research uh, you've done uh, on this. So this is Boris Johnson versus Rishi Sunak. Who do you think would be a better PM? Uh, and the kind of dark blue line there is effectively the Sunak numbers. So 28% all voters say he would be a better PM compared to 17% say Boris Johnson including, actually, the 2019 Conservative voters. Yes, yeah, so even among Conservative voters, the dwindling band of Conservative voters, many more say that Sunak would be a better Prime Minister than Johnson. So I think, in many ways, you would say on that, on the basis of that, he's, um, his time is over in politics for the moment. That's really interesting uh, to hear, because, you know, Boris Johnson's resignation letter, when I left office last year, the government was only a few handful of points behind the polls. He also points to the fact he won the biggest majority in almost half a century. The majority is clearly at risk. What do you say to that argument? Um, he was already very unpopular by the time he, he left office. And the, you know, the, the likelihood of him uh, winning uh, as prime minister is less likely than Sunak, to be quite honest. So, um, you know, yes, he's got a lot. He has some supporters. But really, his, you know, his time, all political careers end in failure. Uh, and you start as maybe popular and end up unpopular. But uh, his trajectory is pretty dramatic. Why would anyone go into politics? Uh, <laughs> that's one reason I never have. <laughs> and me. <laughs> uh, I am also very interested to know what is going on with these by-elections that are coming up, because we've got yeah. three by-elections coming up. It feels to me like the most interesting is probably that one in Boris Johnson's constituency. Absolutely. Oxbridge so, and South Ryslake. So a 7,000 majority. This, if... if, if if um, Starmer is going to win a, a general election convincingly, this ought to be, in many ways, a breeze for Labour. Mm. And they have held the seat uh, as recently as the 1960s, or, uh, you know, the, in that particular part. But uh, that that's really is going to be an acid test. If, that, if they breeze through that, then all the polls showing an average 16-point lead for Labour, people will bake it in. If they don't, or it's only a very narrow win, I think there will be a lot more uncertainty. And then we come on to the Lib Dems' chances in Nadine Dorries' seat in mid-beds, where, again, they might do it. It's a huge majority, 24,500, but they've done things like that before in Amersham. It does require Labour uh, in that seat to really stand down, because if you look at the Amersham vote, uh, vote by election, I think Labour got fewer votes than in virtually any election. They had about only 600 people 
in Amersham actually voted Labour wow. uh, in that by-election. So it requires a fair amount of tactical voting. And I think the challenge in this situation, as we approach, as we're now much closer to a general election, is is Labour going to really stand aside to give the, um, you know, to give everybody a chance? That's really interesting, because Ed yeah. Davies gone to this yeah. seat. And to be honest, I had a look at this. This is, yeah. you can have a look here, this is what happened last time. Yeah. Uh, you can see the Lib Dems in third place. I looked yeah. at that and I was like, that's optimistic, isn't it, from the Lib Dems? Are they, you know, but maybe you're right. Maybe if there was a bit of tactical voting, yes. things could change. That, that, that's probably their best prospect. And then we go on to, of course... Um, Selby and Ainsley. Selby and Ainsley, where, again, you know, a big swing needed. It's, it's actually gone more and more Tory over mm. the last few elections with Nigel Adams. Uh, again, you'd want to see some really good progress there by Labour. Maybe the Liberal Democrats decide not to bother too much there and uh, leave it to Labour to have a go. Who knows? But uh, again, you'll be looking for signs. Everybody will be looking for signs that Labour really is delivering on the ground. Uh, I guess the Conservatives just hope to get this all over and done with as quickly as possible. Fascinating. Is there a landing zone finally for Rishi Sunak, do you think, at the general election? There's, well, I mean, the Conservatives are currently on 28 percentage points. One of the rules of British politics is that you can put a parrot on a stick and it should, if it's standing for Labour or the Conservatives, get a around 29-30% of the vote. Jeremy Corbyn, I thought, was going to break this rule in 2017 uh, because he started off the general election campaign on 26%, but lo and behold, he was steamed <laughs> past that number. So nobody, you know, this will be unknown territory if, if this happens. It will also be unknown territory, though, for Keir Starmer if he becomes Prime Minister because his personal ratings mm. are some of the lowest for any leader of the opposition who looks like they're going to win a general election. He's not particularly popular as an individual, but maybe now we're fed up with excitement and charisma and we just want something else. <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating. You know what, it's been really interesting to talk. I feel like I've learned an awful lot from this conversation. So thank mm -hmm. you very much for coming on the programme. Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, there you go. Uh, ben Page talking us through uh, some of the polling figures there. An interesting corrective there to the narrative about Boris Johnson's popularity. Uh, and also a bit of a look forward to those three key by-elections. It could be very significant indeed. Now, we are going to be talking uh, to the chair of the Junior Doctors' Committee of the BMA ahead of a fresh round of strikes uh, next week. That is Rob uh, Lawrenson. So, a little later on the programme as well, we're going to be talking about the menopause uh, with the Labour MP, Carolyn Harris. So, two very interesting uh, stories uh, coming up next. But we are also going to be going live to Ukraine and speaking to our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, the first British broadcaster to the scene of flooding after the blowing up of a key dam in Ukraine. Really delighted to have Alex on the programme this morning. Now, junior doctors in the NHS out on strike again next week, starting on Wednesday morning for three days. And their union, the British Medical Association, says the government's offer isn't credible. Ministers say demands for up to 35% increases to make up for years of below inflation pay at settlements is unaffordable. Well, we're joined now by the BME's junior doctor committee chair, Rob Lawrenson, who joins us now. Thanks Good morning, for being on the programme. So strikes next week. What's the impact going to be? Well, I think it's a real shame that we're having to call strike action again because the government's offer, which was 5% and £1,500, was nothing to that uh, began to even restore the pay erosion and, in fact, would have led to another real terms pay cut. So, unfortunately, we've had to call for another three days of strike action and I'm afraid that there will be some disruption in elective and outpatient care for patients, which I don't think anyone in this country can afford. So I don't understand why the government won't come back to the table and won't put a credible offer to the table. I want to talk about what a credible offer would look like in a moment, but just to sort of talk in a minute about the impact on patients. You know, we're looking at some of the hospital plans for the strikes and, you, you know, you often see statements like this one from King's College Hospital in London. You know, to help us safely manage the impact of the strikes, we've taken the decision to postpone the vast majority of non-urgent appointments and procedures. You know, non-urgent makes it sound not so bad, but, you know, these people might be waiting months, years even, for procedures. Would you like to apologise to them? Well, I, I think you make a really good point there in that when, you, when um, hospital leaders say non-urgent, mm. non-urgent might be something like non-cancer, but it's still really important to each individual patient who has been waiting. So would you apologise to them? Often waiting for a really long time. I think what's really important is that the government has failed 
for over a decade now to produce a credible workforce plan that's going to be able to address outpatient waiting times. And we've seen over the last 10 years, waiting times for appointments go up and up and up. It's the government's responsibility to fund and resource a healthcare system that works for everyone in this country. I think a lot of people would agree with that, including people who are being impacted by these strikes. But why don't you just apologise to the people who, as you say, will be impacted by the strikes next week? The strikes don't have to go ahead, though. The Do government can come apologize. to the table and the government can give us a credible offer. Oh, I will, I promise I will talk to you about a credible pay offer, but, but would, you, would you like to apologise to the people or, or is that not something you're happy to do? I, I can understand that there's going to be an immense amount of frustration from patients and from our other colleagues when our, uh, when our doctors go on strike this weekend. And it's going to cause an immense source of frustration for everyone. Myself, my family, we all rely on the NHS as well. And the disruption caused is not pleasant for anyone involved. It's a disaster, and it's a disaster that falls primarily at the feet of government. OK. OK, understood. Uh, now, what is the current st state of play, then, when it comes to talks? Well, the government, actually, they obliterated any sense of good faith in those negotiations when they came out of an offer of 5% and £1,500. This is an offer that's been tabled to all public sector, pay work, uh, all public sector workers. And it just goes to show that Rishi Sunak, who's the man who's leading this decree, doesn't recognise the detail and nuance of each individual industry. He wants to treat us all with a blunt instrument of the same pay offer. And it doesn't recognise the extreme pressures that doctors are under and the extreme pay erosion that doctors have suffered over the last 15 years. You say that, you know, everyone's got this offer and you make the argument that actually it's a blunt instrument, that there are specific things about junior doctors. But I guess the counter-argument would be, why are you different from other people in the public sector, many of them, including people who work for the NHS, who have accepted the offer on the table? So doctors have suffered now a 31.7% pay erosion. It's increased because Rishi Sunak failed to deliver on keeping inflation down over the year 22-23. And doctors have suffered for so long because we've been operating on a system of goodwill, working under intense pressures in the NHS, not just during the pandemic, but before. And I think it's really, frankly, wrong for this government to continue offering real terms pay cuts, even during this dispute, which is fundamentally about pay restoration. You say you call the strike because the government's failed to make a credible pay offer. I guess the government would say you've also failed to make a credible pay offer as well, if you like. You know, originally you said you wanted a 35% increase. Some would say that is just never going to happen. What would you accept? So our pay demand is for full pay restoration so that no doctor is worth less now than they were in 2008 because we've sustained 15 years of pay cuts. So what would that mean then, in simple terms? What, what pay rise are you looking for? Something that reverses our, uh, our pay erosion for the last so, 15 so years. So what is that then? What is that number? Is that 35%? Well, it depends, depending on how many years we want to look over it. And that's something that we're interested in discussing with the government in order to make the one-off cost look smaller. But can I, I notice... I'm, I'm, was... I'm, just to, I'm just trying to get to the simple kind of headline here. Uh, forgive me for you know, being slightly bamboozled by the figures, but, but, but what, what is that roughly? I mean, are you talking... 10%? Are you talking 35%? What, what would that look like? Well, it depends how many years we want to look over. OK, so how many course... years do you want to look over, then? What, what, what would it be? Well, we're happy to look over a range of years, but we need to be working with governments to understand where their headspace is and what they think is affordable. Now, I think when they say fair and reasonable, then they're not being fair and reasonable. A real-terms pay cut this year is further pay erosion. It so goes would a 10% no pay rise be fair and reasonable? No, it wasn't. So you because need more than 10%? We would, yes, because our pay erosion has been 31.7% now over 15 years. So you want more than 30% pay rise? We would need to structure it over a series of years, and that's something that we'd be happy to do. But I noticed in one of your previous interviews, you yourself even described £1 billion as a rounding error. Uh, yeah, this was talking about the... <laughs> very good attention to detail. I was talking about uh, Labour's uh, £28 billion uh, green uh, investment, for example. So if you were looking at a Labour government, which we could very well be seeing, would you be happy then if they wouldn't give you a 35% pay rise, but they'd be willing to spend £28 billion on green investment? Is that what you're saying? 
So our priorities here are to represent doctors and to be able to restore the pay erosion that doctors have seen. Because as you said at the beginning of our, of our interview, waiting times for appointments are astronomically high. It's not fair or reasonable for patients to be waiting two years for outpatient elective activity. And we can only, do, we can only fix that issue if we fix the workforce crisis. Um, on Thursday, you announced that you're re-balloting uh, members to extend your strike mandate beyond August. So how long could these strikes go on for? Well, we'll be re-balloting between the 19th of June and the 31st of August. Mm. That will give us an extended six months mandate, which will look towards March of 2024. And if we need to, we will re-ballot again during that period to extend our mandate further. So it could... You're talking about the first deadline being effectively March next year, but that could be extended if, if you don't get what you want. You're in this for the long haul. Our members have given us a clear instruction. They would like us to pursue full pay restoration back to 2008. And that's what we intend to do in our representation of our doctors and our healthcare system. No matter what the impact is on the NHS and on patients. The long-term impact of, on the NHS without a workforce and without doctors as they flee to countries like Canada, Australia and New Zealand is that these waiting lists will increase. We heard from the Royal College of Radiologists recently that there are significant delays to cancer care all year round, not just in winter, all year round, because of a lack of workforce. OK, thank you very much for being uh, on the programme. You've certainly made your points uh, very strongly this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there you go. Uh, junior doctors uh, strikes, no end in sight, uh, pretty clear from that interview, uh, unless uh, there is a breakthrough in those talks that, frankly, uh, that does look optimistic, doesn't it, uh, if you look at the current state of play. Now, it's five days since we learned uh, that the Nova Kakova Dam in Ukraine had been destroyed and a huge amount of water unleashed, leading to devastating flooding and environmental damage in Ukraine. And it's a key moment in the war as Ukrainian forces launch a counter-offensive to retake occupied land. Now, Sky News was the first British broadcaster in the area and our special correspondent Alex Crawford and team sent us some extraordinary reports. She joins us now uh, live from Ukraine. A, a real pleasure to have you on the programme, Alex. Just talk us through the kind of thing you've been witnessing in the last few days. Well, it's a, it's a huge calamity. Um, the very first day, the day that it happened, we got down there sort of sometime in the afternoon and the first thing that struck us was, first, how much water there was there and, secondly, how few people were actually helping and how most of the people who were helping were Ukrainians. Uh, by that stage, there had already been declared uh, an emergency. President Zelensky had been up since the beginning of the morning telling everyone that it was holding emergency meetings with his National Security Council, alerting the world uh, that there'd been this huge calamity. The mayor of the area had been telling people to get out, save yourselves, move quickly, because the a critical point was going to hit within a few hours. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. Over the next three, four days, we saw the waters creep up and up and up. So streets that we were able to wade through at the beginning, you couldn't get down without a boat by the following morning. And then the third morning, it was, uh, it was up covering the top of street signs and um, the tip of, of roofs. Even three, four days on, there was still hardly any sign, certainly, that we saw any evidence at all of international aid organisations taking part in what was clearly a huge humanitarian and ecological disaster. It was mainly volunteers, a lot of Ukrainian volunteers, Ukrainian residents who were just finding their own boats, getting dinghies and, and, and pushing them out to try and save animals and humans, many of whom um, had stayed after that first night thinking because the waters were coming in uh, at a regular but slowish pace, they'd stayed overnight and then the following morning found themselves, uh, you know, surrounded by water and unable to get out with no electricity and things were obviously going to get worse and worse. So the President Zelensky by the third day was de really denouncing what he called the shameful indifference by uh, certain global world players. He really criticised 
the aid organizations. Of course, remember, a lot of the aid organizations are already based in Ukraine because of the ongoing humanitarian catastrophe calls caused by the war. Um, so there was, there was no sudden having to rush to this country to help out. They were already based here, but very, very few seem to be on the ground actually helping out. And then by Thursday, it got even worse because by this stage, there were quite a large collection of Ukrainian volunteers, citizens um, trying to help out and, and really motor the, the uh, relief operation when the, there was a lot of shelling and attacks right on the evacuation points, so more than one evacuation point, uh, which we witnessed ourselves. And this morning we've heard that uh, the UN has asked for and been refused permission to get to the, the left bank, which is under Russian occupation, the other side of the Dnipro River. So there is an ongoing human catastrophe and, and ecocide is how President Zelensky described it, this environmental catastrophe because it's not just the short-term impact of what's happening right in front of us with elderly, frail, vulnerable uh, people and children, some of whom are fleeing themselves from the Russian occupied side and making it over and talking about how Russian troops are looting their houses on the left bank, how they themselves appear to have been taken surprise by the dam burst and how uh, they're trying to steal their boats to escape they, and, and, and how they feel like the, 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 they're being attacked as they're leaving. Not only is that happening, but there's a, an ongoing long-term impact of 600 square kilometers of just the Kherson region, the Kherson Oblast, which is underwater. And this water is filthy. It's full of sewage, oil, toxic chemicals, all sorts of things, as well as floating landmines which have been dislodged by this torrent of water which is rushing down. And, and we've seen 160 kilometers away from uh, Kherson city in Odessa, sofas and broken uh, washing machines and even a, a dog floating on top of a, a door landing up 160 kilometers downstream of the river. So a huge catastrophe here that's unfolding on top of the war with evacuations being conducted under fire. It's extraordinary. Just when you feel that things can get any worse in Ukraine, it feels like something else utterly unimaginable happens. Alex, thank you so much for being on the programme and thank you for your reporting that you've been doing on Sky News as well uh, from Ukraine. Alex Crawford speaking to us there on the programme. Now, Menopause is perhaps a word that we should be hearing an awful lot more on uh, television, uh, something that we haven't always been good at talking about. And it does feel uh, that given so much of the population is going to experience it, it's something that we could do a bit better about speaking about. Now, my next guest is an MP who wants to uh, do more to challenge some of those uh, debates and challenges around women's health, give more support to the 13 million women currently going through stages of the menopause. Karen Harris is with us today. It's been a real pleasure to uh, have you on the show. Thank you, Sophie. Um, you know what? It's been such a busy week in Westminster and I've been really keen to do this interview on the menopause and I don't think I would have forgiven myself and I thought because of the soap <laughs> opera that's going on with the blokes in Westminster that we didn't end up I doing did that this conversation. <laughs> so I'm delighted to have Thank you here. You. Um, you're chair of your party yeah. group on the menopause. Why is it important that we talk about this more? Well, 51% of the population, 13 million menopausal women in this country and only one for 14% of them are getting the support and the medication they need. We've got to do better. Look, women are giving up work. Women are walking away from marriages. Domestic violence increases. Suicide increases by 16% amongst menopausal women. And it's all down to a lack of knowledge and a lack of services. It's so easily remedied, Sophie. So you talk about the lack of knowledge. Mm. And I think this is quite important, mm. isn't it? Because you can't get help unless you know what it is you need to get help for, that you're going through it? Or do you think people are just missing the signs of it? Well, I'm a classic example of that in that, I mean, I thought in 2010 I was having a nervous breakdown. I ended up on antidepressants, stayed on them for eight years, believing I had mental health problems, became an MP, was talking about menopause in the House of Commons and how we needed to do more for women didn't acknowledge that I was menopausal mm. because I didn't link up the, the other symptoms. I just looked at the anxiety and the depression. I didn't think about the restless legs, the dry eyes, the, the migraine, the, the itchy skin, mm. the aches and the pains. I just thought that was part of being a woman and getting older. Once I embraced it, I went on HRT. I'm 20 years younger 
That's extraordinary. Definitely. That's extraordinary, isn't it? And do you think it's because everyone just experiences it differently? Every woman's menopause is different, but there's such a lack of knowledge around what the menopause is. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we can work with and we can look after and we can get women through it. And women are wonderful. They will survive anything, we know that. But the menopause is something most definitely we can survive and thrive from. Um, it was really interesting because I was reading some of what you've written about your own experiences, saying that you didn't realise that you were in the menopause um, and saying that you were very tired, you were having mm. to push yourself mm. at work. Uh, and you said, um, I used to love going on holiday to places mm. like Florida. Even the thought of going to the local park was mm. too much. I, mean, I just didn't do it. Just didn't do it. I mean, I came up with so many excuses not to go on holidays. And I, I'm away all week. When I come home, I want, you know, I don't want to be packing a case to go on holidays. Any excuse not to have to venture out of my safe zone where I could, I knew how, how far I could push myself. I could walk up the stairs halfway, stop carry on the rest. Mm. I'm a completely different person. Mm. I've been taking ownership. I, I've owned my menopause. And you say we're not HRT, HRT. Why do you think people are reluctant to use HRT? Because there was a really bad study that came out mm. about 25 years ago which said that HRT could cause breast cancer. Mm. What they never told us is that 20 women developed breast cancer. Those 20 women actually had breast cancer in the family. So the yeah. chances are they were going to get it anyway. But a lot of the doctors haven't forgotten that. A lot of women haven't forgotten that. So there's a massive piece of work needs to be done about re-educating people yeah. on the safetiness yeah. of menopause. It's also a brilliant... HRT pre pre prevents other mm. conditions like mm. um, dementia, mm. heart disease. There's so many things that when your hormones go, mm. you are going to get more of. Mm. And also, if it improves your quality of life oh, so dramatically... that is. I can't tell you the difference it made to me. And every woman I speak to says that once they take control of it, mm. their life is transformed. Uh, now, you published a report at the end of last year yeah. with some recommendations for change. What, what do you think needs to happen? Everything that's in my report. Whatever I say that happens to needs to happen or menopause needs to happen. And I will not stop until we get to the point where... We're not asking for women to have special treatment. We're asking for women to have the opportunity to be normal. Mm -hmm. that we're given the respect and the consideration in all areas of social policy that actually acknowledge that menopause is preventing women from working, it's causing women to be on long-term sick, it's causing women to be on antidepressants. Women, women, women. Women's health. Need I say more, Sophie? No, you don't need to say any more. That, that will do just fine. Thank you so much for being on the programme this morning. It's been really great to talk to you. you. A very powerful advocate for uh, that cause in particular. Well, it's been such a packed show. We are going to go straight into Sophie Ridge on Sunday at The Take. It is a roller coaster. Uh, Scott has ripped up the rundown uh, in my ear. Uh, so it's a chance to look back at our interviews this morning on the programme, try and work out what we've learned and what it means for the week ahead, because it certainly has been a dramatic few days uh, in Westminster, because, of course, uh, we've seen, uh, haven't we, because we've seen the resignation of Boris Johnson, the dramatic resignation of Boris Johnson, and on the programme today, of course, we heard the world has moved on, according to Grant Shapps. I'm hoping we should be hearing from Grant Shapps now. The world has sort of moved on from what was quite a dramatic period under Brexit and, of course, under the, uh, you know, the, the issues related to, the, to COVID and, and the vaccine and the rest of it. So do you think the world's moved on from Boris Johnson? Well, I mean, clear, just factually speaking, Boris Johnson's no longer um, Prime Minister. And, you know, as I say, I think people uh, appreciate... I, I, I like Boris Johnson. I worked under his administration. He had successes, many successes to his name, in, including breaking the Brexit impasse and including getting this country vaccinated first. Um, but there was also always a lot of drama that came with all of that. The world's moved on. Uh, we're here to give us our take on that and the morning's other political interviews. I'm delighted to say we are joined by the political editor of The Sun on Sunday, that's Kate Ferguson, and the acting deputy political editor for The Guardian, Peter Walker. Um, yeah. I feel like you two people who I know very well, because I see you read your stuff so much, and yet this is the first time you're on the programme, so it's great to have you Thank you. Here. It's great. What a week for it as well. Um, we just heard from Grant Chaps. I mean, I thought he was pretty brutal when it came to Boris Johnson. What, what do you think? Yeah, the thing is with Grant, you always get this kind of affable, very conversational mm. interview, don't you? And then scratch beneath the surface and he kind of kills Boris with a thousand tiny cuts, doesn't he? 
country's moved on now. Boris can go and make money elsewhere in the world, I think you pointed out <laughs> earlier. So, yeah, definitely quite damning in what he does say, even though he delivers it very kindly. He sugars the pill. Yeah, and it's interesting because he's obviously a number 10's person this morning. And so we can read between the lines and say that this is an authorised point of view from mm. number 10. I think it is. I think Rishi Sunak just really, really wants this circus to move on. And, you know, it's a difficult time. It's going to be a difficult few weeks. The by-election is going to be tricky. But at the back of their minds, they're going to be thinking, this could be it. This kind of travelling circus that comes into town every few weeks could finally be over. And for number 10, that would ultimately probably be quite a good thing. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Well, Grant Shapps, actually, I did ask him how likely a Boris Johnson comeback was. Let's have a little quick listen to what he has to say here. Do you think Boris Johnson will come back? I have. Uh, the one thing I know about Boris Johnson is never predict what Boris Johnson will, will uh, do next. So I have no idea uh, what will happen uh, with regards to that. Would you like uh, him I to? I do know. I, I, I'm sure he's got many other things he wants to get on to doing. That doesn't sound he's... like you're really gagging. Oh, I was going to say, I, I was gonna say he's, spent, he's spent a huge amount of... Uh, he's spending a lot of time around the world uh, uh, making a, a lot of... Uh, so that's what you want to do, leave the country, speeches. not just Parliament. I, I, as I say, don't, uh, you won't find me saying bad things about Boris. I enjoyed working <laughs> with Boris. I thought he was... Uh, I thought he was the right man for that time, particularly to break that Brexit impasse, which he successfully did. I thought he was very good lead in leadership of the world in Ukraine after the invasion and other things. But a lot of drama came with it. You won't hear me saying bad things about Boris Johnson. <laughs> well, I'm not totally <laughs> sure. Apart from the last 20 minutes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> what do you think the chances are of a Boris Johnson comeback? It's so odd because I began my working week as a Sunday reporter on Tuesday mm. and I had a lunch with someone on Wednesday and they said, don't rule out Boris coming back as leader. People are already succession mm. planning in case Rishi doesn't win the next election. And then you end the week with Boris Johnson resigning and people are still talking about whether or not he could come back as leader. So the chances of a comeback, I mean, certainly not yet, right? He's only just delivered his resignation letter. But you can rule nothing out with Boris, can you? And clearly a lot of his supporters are still sort of talking about it, still a little bit of hope that maybe one day in the future he is this vote winner that could come back, could deliver. Yeah, he said for now, didn't he, in his resignation statement. I mean, he's deliberately leaving the door open there. I mean, with the caveat, my political predictions are very often wrong. <laughs> I can't see it happening. I mean, the interesting thing that Ben Page, going through the polling mm. numbers, Boris Johnson is not actually that popular. And, and, and there's this big kind of myth built up about him because he's a politician who's very, very different. Mm. He has this kind of playfulness to him, which voters do like. He treats it all, he kind of looks into the camera and says, you know, between you and me, isn't this all a big joke? Mm. And people like that. And he delivered a very different Conservative vote in 2019. But if you look at the actual votes, he only got about 1.2 percentage points more than Theresa May got in 2017, which was seen as really, really bad. He just won them under the British electoral system in a way that meant the majority was uh, 80 seats. So I always think that this idea that he's this amazing vote winner, I mean, in, as London mayor, he did very, very well, but that's probably the high point of his kind of popularity. Yeah. And I think people have tried him as prime minister. They've seen what he's like, and I don't think people would necessarily want to go back to the chaos. And that's... Yeah. Not just the public, but his uh, MPs too. Yeah, they're particularly his MPs as well. It's interesting to say that uh, as well, isn't it? I just wonder, because I'm trying to work out where this leaves Rishi Sunak. Is this really destabilising? Because you've got Boris Johnson writing this extraordinary diatribe against him and you've got the by-elections, of course, to come. Or actually, will Number 10 be thinking, thank goodness, he's leaving the parliamentary stage, things can get back to normal? Yeah, I mean, Boris has been this king across the water on the back benches, not often on the back benches, often yeah. around <laughs> kind of doing other things, but that's been his role. And I think Number 10 are kind of watching to see which way this goes. On the one hand, you've got these three kind of really nightmare mm. by-elections, mid-beds, they're going to throw the kitchen sink at that, but that could go Lib Dem. Uxbridge, they've already privately sort of admitting that's going to go Labour. And Selby, I think probably more expected to be a late, uh, Tory hold, mm. but we will get, wait and see. But clearly, Boris, he'll always be very important, a former PM, mm. a former leader, but, crucially, he won't be there in Parliament. Might that actually give Rishi some more breathing space if, if, if he gets over mm. these landmines in between, which is these three by-elections? Yeah, what's your take? I think it's really interesting. I mean, what Kate was saying earlier about the week feeling incredibly long, I spent... <laughs> it has, not it? I know. Really I spent has. the start of the week with Rishi Sunak on his US trip, and this was this kind of very different, very non-Boris Johnson incremental mm. trying to build up kind of policy achievements here and there. So he met Joe Biden, they got on well, they 
signed this uh, agreement, which doesn't necessarily achieve much, but it's symbolically quite interesting. And on the plane back, he seemed quite chipper. And it's this whole thing that whenever you talk to ministers or uh, MPs and they look at what a Rishi Sunak election win could be, it's just being steady, mm -hmm. steady, steady. Hope in a year, 18 months' time, the inflation figures are better, growth is better, and they find this tiny landing zone. And every time Boris Johnson pops up, it pushes them off course. Mm. And they knew, I mean, it's not like there was no way this was going to end in drama at some point, because it could have potentially been even worse if it had gone to a vote on whatever the Privileges mm. Committee mm. verdict yeah. was, and they have to, you know, have dozens of MPs voting for Johnson, and then you have potentially a by-election, all that drama. Mm. So you could almost argue this is about as good as it gets, which is still not very good. Yes, yeah, still not very good, yeah. <laughs> but perhaps the best possible outcome. One thing I was thinking, Sophie, just then, is um, beware prime ministers that dare get on a plane and go away. Because I remember, <laughs> I was with Boris, I think it was in Rwanda, and then he went off to Germany afterwards, and he came back to these by-election losses, right? And that was sort of the, really the beginning of the end for him, and it all unraveled pretty quickly after that. So uh, uh, Rishi needs to be careful whenever he gets on that jet. <laughs> I think. Things are in order back home. Yeah, totally. Keep an eye on them. Don't yeah. trust them back yeah, in yeah, Westminster. Yeah. Um, we heard a lot from Grant Champs this morning, uh, but we also spoke to Gretu Hari, who was with Boris Johnson in his city hall days as mayor, but also more recently his communications director. And we heard a very, very different line from him. Let's hear from what he has to say. What he's done is take charge this weekend of a situation that was out of his control and drifting, you know, inevitably towards a very, very unhappy and undignified sort of conclusion. And so, if you like, he's gone jumping in, you know, waving union jacks, if you like, um, rather than be dragged kicking and screaming out of Parliament. And though I won't join those who openly criticise the process and all that, I do understand why he feels... Uh, understandably aggrieved by the process that has not only taken him out of office, stopped him being prime minister, but now hounded him out of politics. Because, as you rightly said, he is a man who uh, defied political gravity and only a couple of years ago, a few years ago, won the biggest majority for 40 years. He dramatically quit his seat for now. Do you think he's going to be back? Uh, you never know. He keeps, you know, he deliberately leaves us guessing, doesn't he? Hasta la vista, baby, or, you know, more classical references. It's very important. It's virtually impossible to, to write him off. But I don't think this is part of an elaborate plot mm. to sort of destabilise and topple Rishi Sunak. I think uh, Boris Johnson feels that there is an opportunity for him now to go off and, you know, lick his wounds, but also sees new opportunities. He's very talented. A uh, person who's in demand around the world as a speaker, he's writing his memoirs, he's a great writer. So there's a little time for him to be out of the fray, but will he come back one day? Who knows? The relationship between Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson is obviously pretty toxic, right? Well, I sat down with him every morning, you know, about 8.15, for seven months of my life. Felt like a lot longer. And, um, and actually, I was surprised when I got there because I had not met... Uh, Rishi Sunak, but the personal chemistry was very, very warm. The two of them got on really well. But There's they, good banter. that was at one time. It's yeah. now changed. Well, yeah, but what I'm saying is I don't think it's a personal thing. I think it's, you know, Rishi is now doing the job that Boris used to do. Now, none of us feel very good about people doing that if it's been forced upon us. It was quite interesting talking to Gutte because we did get a bit more of a sense about what those allies around Boris Johnson are feeling he used the phrase hounded out, um, that voters in 2019 could feel quite aggrieved by what's happened. Kate, I'm interested in your view on that. What, what do you think Sun on Sunday readers will be on this? Sun on Sunday readers, lots of our readers are Boris voters. Mm. They know Boris, they like Boris. Also, Boris, they've heard of Boris, mm. they like him, they think they know who he is, what he stands for. Now, very few politicians, even few prime ministers, political leaders, can have that kind of reach a kind of resonance with my readers. So there's, there's, you know, we know that there's a lot of love for him. Having, having said that, mm. you know, our readers also do want political stability. Mm -hmm. They want inflation to come down. They want the votes to stop. If you're talking about Rishi's five priorities, they chime actually with our letters pages, our letters bags every week. So it's for our readers, I don't think it's always like a choice between like Boris mm -hmm. versus Rishi. It's not kind of head-on collision. There's a lot of love for Boris, but, you know, really now we just want, um, I think, the economy to improve and that their, their, 
their interests to be yeah. further driven. And what I would say about Boris allies in the parliamentary party, obviously I've been calling them all weekend, and there is real fury among some, real fury at how he's been treated. Others also cross at how he's been treated, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're all going to follow mm. Nigel and Nadine out of the door. Some of these people are sort of just starting their political careers mm. and they're not ready to kind of kiss them goodbye for the boss, no matter how much love they have for the old boss. That is interesting, isn't it? You can kind of get that sense, don't you? I mean, you've got obviously two of his staunchest allies who have quit. But then if they quit Parliament, maybe they lose influence as well, mm -hmm. right? So it's not necessarily a win for Boris. I think it's interesting and I think... The, perhaps the time people knew the game was up for him in terms of him coming back was when Rishi Sunak's Northern Ireland Protocol got voted on and there was all these threats of people who backed Johnson would have voted against it and the rebellion mm. turned out to be tiny. Mm. And, I mean, to go back to what some of the things that Guto was saying, this idea that it's a kind of plot, mm. uh, to take it about, out a bit, a bit broader, I think this is a slightly worrying trend. I mean, politicians have never necessarily taken responsibility for things that have gone wrong. But any time someone leaves office now, it seems to be it's not their fault. Mm. You know, Liz Truss, in her first um, uh, newspaper opinion piece after she left, was blaming kind of shadowy forces. Mm. It wasn't shadowy forces, just her MPs had completely lost confidence and ability to do the job. And a lot of this stuff ties into these ideas about, you know, uh, the blob and mm. kind of anti-Brexit feeling. And we're nowhere near this position we have in the US of conspiracy theories becoming mainstream. But this is what you might call the house-trained end of con conspiracy theories. And I think it's a bit of a worry. I think at some point mm. politicians should say, you know, maybe I did actually mess up. It's interesting, this idea of the blob. Jake Berry mentioned it in his tweet, didn't he, saying it was the blob that effectively forced Boris Johnson out trying to block Brexit. I mean, the blob actually started off as the... Teachers' unions, right? Under Michael Gove. That was the original blob, I uh, think, wasn't yeah. it? Was Back Gove's in the day. Idea, yeah. uh, uh, the teachers' unions trying to block his education reforms, but it's now morphed into a whole, well, any, anything almost. Yeah, but I think uh, we talk about the blob. I I'm a huge fan of the film The Blob, so, I, you know, <laughs> anyway, but, but we, you know, viewers do go and watch it. But anyway, um, but The Blob, yeah, but it's kind of this catch all term, isn't it, for a, a sort of refusenik establishment. Mm. So, whether or not that's a kind of civil service that isn't fully behind real reforms and going for it gung ho or a kind of political establishment, potentially elected, who are kind of seen to be fiddling the... Not the books, what's the word? Like, the, the levers of power, mm, I say, yeah. to get their way. L look, you might like the phrase, the blob, you might not like the phrase, the blob. I think mm. the, the, the thing here is that clearly there is concern among a bunch of Tory MPs that a man that was democratically elected mm -hmm. as PM did Tom Storm to victory with a kind of thumping majority, has now not only been kind of top of form number 10, but also his seat, never through a popular democratic vote, but, you know, with the machinations of Parliament. We Is are that something to think about? Out of time. Okay, it's been sorry. fascinating to talk. Uh, thank you very much for watching Sofa Ridge on Sunday this morning. We probably are the blob for most people uh, in <laughs> yeah. Westminster. From the blob to you, have a great weekend. <laughs>